the most basic kind of loop is the while loop. And the while loop is a lot like an if statement. In an if statement, if you have a variable and you ask a question that is true, then the code that belongs to the if statement will trigger. So you can imagine that when this program runs, it will print out true because var equals 5. I'm just going to add a get ch in here so that the program will halt at the end as well. And there it prints out true. Now a while loop is very similar to an if statement. All I have to do is change this to a while and it will still print true. The difference is, as soon as it's done printing true, it will go back, ask the while loop question again, and if it's still true, it will do this again. So this will just keep printing true for us. There it is. You can see that it's constantly printing true. The program is in what we call an infinite loop. It's never going to come out of it. I have to close the program by hitting the X here. Let me show you how quickly it's executing int number of executions equals zero and I'm going to print out the number of executions and every time it executes I'm going to add one to that value look at that thousands of times a second that's pretty crazy computers are really 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 good at doing the same thing over and over and over very quickly for us. I don't want this loop to go forever, I want it to stop eventually and there's a couple ways of doing that but the best way of doing it is to make this statement here become false sometime during execution of the loop. One easy way to do that is just to do this cn var. Now when I run it it will ask for a variable. It's actually not asking, but it, it is waiting for input. And if I put 5 in here, then when it runs again, 5 equals 5, so it's true, and the while loop continues. If I press 5 again, every time I press 5, it will do this code, then wait for me to type in a number. If I press anything other than 5, like 1 or 51, the program ends, and now it's waiting at the get ch. Another common way to get a loop to stop is after a specific number of times. For example, I can make the loop count and run a specific number of times. Count, while count is less than 100, count equals count plus 1. And I don't need the cn var in there. And when I run this, prints out 100 times. It starts at 0 and it gets all the way to 99. It never reaches 100 because when count is equal to 100 this is no longer true which means it breaks out of the while loop. But, but 0 is less than 100 so it does print out 0 and that's why we still have 100 things printed out here. It, it's just that we start counting at 0 instead of at 1. If we wanted to break out of this loop in another way, for example, after the, the count gets to 20, if count is equal to 20, I can do this, break. Break is a keyword that tells the compiler to break out of the nearest loop that it's in. When I put curly brackets around the if like this, this doesn't count as a loop, this counts as an enclosure but the nearest loop is right here, this while loop. So now, when I run this program, it will break out when count is equal to 20. Right there, exactly as expected. But break is not as good an option as just having the logic take care of the loop, because break is less structured. In structured programming, the idea is that all of your code is really clearly readable. And even when it gets very complex, you can compartmentalize different pieces of code. One way that that compartmentalization happens is with these curly brackets. These curly brackets, which are enclosures, can be put inside of one another. So here we have an if statement that is what we call nested. 
this if statement is nested inside of this while loop. Inside of this if statement, I can put another while loop. For example, I can do this, int uh, a equals 0 while a is less than 10. See out period a equals a plus 1. When it reaches 20, it will print out 10 periods here because this while loop is saying that it will, it will run 10 times and each time that it runs it will print out a period and then after it prints those 10 periods it will break like so. Now this code right here where we have something happening 10 times or a specific number of times this is really common in fact it's so common that there's a special piece of syntax that's made just to make this easier. And that piece of syntax looks like this, for int a equals 0, while a is less than 10, a plus plus. C out, period. These lines right here are equivalent to these lines right here. What we have in the for loop is three specific different parts. This is the initializer, where we set our counting variable. Then we have our condition. And then we have our increment. You notice here that I put a plus plus instead of a equals a plus one. a plus plus is a different way of saying a equals a plus one. This is what we call a post increment. If, you, if we wanted to do a equals a minus one, then it would look like this, a minus minus. And if we wanted to do a plus 10, then we could use something called a compound operator, which looks like that. More on that in just a second. First, let me show you that this code is equivalent. So when I run this code, we'll see 20 periods. The first 10 will belong here, and the second 10 will come from here. There's the 20 periods. And actually, this is kind of gross. Usually, the for loop looks like that. And I'm going to put a new line in between the two so that we can see both of them, one on top of the other. There they are. The compound operators that I just mentioned, a plus equals 10. This right here is the same as a equals a plus 10. You can put any other math operation here. You can make this a multiplier, a subtraction, a division. You can even use modulo. In fact, there are additional operations that you can do on the computer that don't make a lot of sense outside of computer science that you can put here in the compound. You can do or equals, and equals, x or equals. You can do left shift equals, right shift equals, but We'll get to that some other time. So this idea of counting and doing something over and over, this is very common in computer science, and we have a special piece of syntax for it. Well, there's another thing that we do over and over in computer science, which is check if one number is equal to another. And as you might have guessed, there's another special piece of syntax for that, too. It's called a switch statement. And it looks something like this case 20 check count and in the case that it's 20 do all of this code and what happened how come it didn't stop that's pretty interesting actually I know exactly why it didn't stop the reason it didn't stop is because this break keyword has a special meaning when it's inside of a switch statement. The break keyword is used to separate all of the different cases. For example, case 30, see out, look, 30, break, case 35, see out, dot, 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 and if I don't put a break between the next case, case 40, 
see out exclamation points. Then both of these will trigger when it's case 35. I'm going to run this again. Oh, and I have an error. Um, A. Oh, this error has to do with something called scope. And the reason for this error is actually a little bit complicated. I'll explain it in a minute. But this variable here, int a, happens to only exist in this case. But because it's in a switch statement, there's a little bit of confusion because the syntax would allow me to access it here. In, for example, case 30, a equals 1. But in practice, if case 20 never gets run, a will never exist because it isn't unless case 20 is run that A is initialized. So one thing that I can do is I can take A outside of the scope of the switch statement like this and that will solve the problem. And let's scroll up and find there's 30. So when we, when we got to 20 it did the printing and when it got to 30, it printed out look 30 right there. And then when it, when it printed that out, it, it finished and it jumped out of the switch statement. When it got to 35, it printed out three dots. And then, because there was no break, it fell through. That's what we, that's what we say when, a case, when one case finishes and it goes to the next case without a break. We say that it fell through and it triggered case 40. So we've got three dots and four exclamation points here for 30, but only four exclamation points here for 40. I can make an else case in a switch statement. So if none of these are true, if none of these cases end up being found, then it can instead go to a default case. And I'll just have my default case print an underscore. So let's see what happens when I run this. So everywhere it prints an underscore except for the 20th case, the 30th case, the 35th, the 40th, and that's it. Everywhere else it prints an underscore after printing C out true number of executions and L. And the reason we see these underscores at the beginning of the next line rather than at the end of this one is because of this end L right here. Now in our switch statement, we've got a whole bunch of numbers here. And as we've seen in other parts of programming, you should be able to replace any of these numbers with a variable. For example, I should be able to make a variable called 20 equals 20 and put that variable here. This has the benefit of being a little bit more descriptive. So if I ever make a, a switch statement that has a whole bunch of different things in it, the case will describe what that thing is with its variable name. Unfortunately, when I compile this, I don't get good code because a switch statement must have a constant value as its case. It's actually pretty easy to do this with a variable. All I have to say is const in front of the variable and it becomes constant. Now the code will compile and run. Oh, why is it not running? Oh, because I forgot to close it. Now it'll compile and run. There we go. Now when you have a constant variable, you're not allowed to change it. So I can't do 20 plus plus. I can't increment it by one because now it won't be 20 anymore. It'll be something else. If I want to do this, I'll have to make a new variable. I want to go back to that scope thing that I mentioned earlier where A had to be outside of this switch statement because A's scope was only in here but there was no piece of syntax limiting it to here. If I wanted to put A back in this location I actually could put it back here but I would need to put A in its own scope like this these curly brackets, these enclosures, they form a scope. And anything inside of a scope exists only within the scope given. So at the end of this curly bracket, 
this A variable here will disappear and it won't be able to be accessed anywhere else. Now there won't be a problem with any other piece of code having potentially access to A because it won't, it can't. This scope right here is the limit of where A can exist. In a similar way, inside of this while loop, that's the only place that 20 exists. And if I tried to access 20 outside of the while loop, like this, see out 20. It's very upset with me. It doesn't know where the identifier 20 came from. If I try to compile this, it'll tell me the same thing. Right there, 20 is undefined because it's outside of the scope. It's inside of this of this scope within the while loop. And once the while loop is over, it stops existing. If I move 20 out of this scope to here, now it exists in both scopes, here and here. An inner scope can overwrite the values of an outer scope. So I could do this, const int 20 equals 21. And this would work because even though 20 now exists in this scope and in this scope, it's only going to use the most recently created version of any variable. So this 20 can only reference that. It will never reference this unless I close that. So at this point, with 20 equaling 21, we will see that at 21 is where we get these dots right there.